secured. Aloha mai kako. Aloha ahi ahi. Welcome to Hawaiian History Month. My name is Manuai Peters. No mauna lua o ahu mai au, e a nae ke noho nei i kai lua o ahu. Veli na ke aloha ya o kua pau. Today is week three of our panel one of week three of Hawaiian History Month. Our theme for this week is Eola Kalahui Hawaii, Culture Based Education. The purpose of Hawaiian History Month is to really educate the community about a wide range of topics related to Hawaiian culture and history. These topics are rooted in our observance of Queen Lili'uokalani's birthday, September 2nd. It is her birthday month, and we celebrate her legacy, her benevolence with Hawaiian History Month. Today's esteemed panel for H is HCBE, or Mo'oku Auhau of a Movement. We're bringing together community advocates, these educators to discuss the history of the movement of Hawaiian culture-based education, its successes and its impacts today. Tonight, we hope to discuss what were the antecedents of today's Hawaiian culture-based uh, education programs. Programs today, such as Punana Leo, Kulakaya Puni, Na Kulakaya Olelo, Hawaiian Focused Charter Schools, and many more programs and schools in operation today that we may also consider as offering Ike Hawaii, such as Kuaihelani Hawaiian Study Center at Punahou. So our methodology tonight is really to identify, share, and call out those pioneering programs, projects, events, and leaders, the people, or the antecedents to today's mosaic of Hawaiian culture-based education. I want to take a few moments here to introduce these four incredible panelists that we have with us tonight, all who have contributed greatly to the development of Hawaiian culture-based education in Hawaii over their lives work. HCBE is a sort of a short version of Hawaiian culture-based education that we like to use. So if you hear us talking about HCBE, we are referring to Hawaiian culture-based sure, yeah. education. Aloha nice. my kako panelists. Nice. You guys don't need any more we know who you are, but just for the for posterity's sake, we want to give you a formal introduction. I had to really whittle down these bios. They were so they're so accomplished and so full of um, information. But because we have a limited time tonight, we're going to keep it a little short. I want to start with Kalihua Krug, Dr. Kalihua Krug. Kalihua is proudly from the Waianae Coast on the island of Oahu. His ohana, they live in Lua Lua Le. He has worked as a Kayapuni immersion teacher a Hawaiian language teacher educator at the oh, University of Hawaii at Manoa, and was a state level administrator for the Hawaiian language immersion program at the DOE okay. Office of Hawaiian Education. In 2019, Kalihua yeah. became the wait, principal of wait. Kawaihona Okanaawao Public Charter School in Nanakuli. He studies Hawaiian language, philosophy, and worldview, and is a practitioner of cacao, traditional Hawaiian tattooing, and is also a very accomplished Hawaiian musician. Aloha mai, kalehua. Aloha, aloha mai. Aloha no. Our next panelist tonight is Dr. Walter Kahumoku III. Dr. Kahumoku, welcome. Dr. Kahumoku has dedicated his career to improving the educational well being of Hawaiian learners. As a former school administrator, director of professional development and researcher, Walter has published and presented on native education policy, culture-based education, uh, and educator professional development, and native grounded curriculum. So also curriculum work as well. He is also quite skilled in instructional practices and assessment practices as well. Dr. Kahumoku is currently at UH West Oahu in the chancellor's office and also faculty at UH Manoa College of Education. Velina mai e kauka kahumoku. 
Our next guest, a very special woman, our only wahine on this panel tonight, is Namaka Rollins. She has served as the first director of Aha Puna Naleo, starting in 1990. Ms. Rollins has spent her career as an advocate for the revitalization of the Hawaiian language. Starting in 1984, Namaka volunteered with the first Puna Naleo in Hilo while pursuing her degree and studying Hawaiian language. The Aha Puna Naleo was established in 1983 and will be celebrating its 40th anniversary next year. Her interests in education are in education policy and research in indigenous language issues. And it really has spanned her career in advocating for early childhood education and for families in this movement to reclaim indigenous language. She continues today as a senior director for the Aha Puna Naleo and is a Hawaiian homesteader in Pana Eva, Hawaii. Mahalo nui and velina mai. Our fourth panelist tonight, who I know is born and raised in Manoa, is Jay Kimo Alama Keolana. He can account for seven generations of chanters, dancers, teachers, singers, musicians, composers, and recording artists before him. Kimo is one of two living persons who have actually learned hula kuahu, or religious hula. This year, Kimo celebrates 51 years of teaching all forms of hula. He started his career in Hawaii's DOE as a secondary school social studies teacher. I think that was on Molokai. And a teacher trainer with the University of Hawaii at Manoa's College of Education. Later, Kimo was an instructor of Hawaiian language and studies at Honolulu Community College. Kimo has taught hula olapa or traditional hula at Kapi'olani Community College for several years as well. Kimo is currently a Kumu Ike Hawaii and Kumu Hula at Punahou School. He's from Manoa, but is now a homesteader in Nanakuli. Velina mai, Kimo. Aloha kako. Awesome, mahalo nui ya okuapau. So tonight we have these advocates, educators, and leaders in the HCBE space. But all of you are once haumana and learners, and perhaps we still are, right? You know, thinking back, I want as an icebreaker question for tonight's panel, thinking back, what was your first experience of Hawaiian culture-based education as a youngster? Can you describe that first experience, that first memory? Um, I'll, go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll <laughs> go. You know, um, when... When I was born, okay, and I was born, I was born about the middle of the 20th century. So I'm kind of old. <laughs> my, my maternal grandmother lived on Upena Street in Makaha. And she spoke Hawaiian. Okay, my kupuna were born in the Hawaiian kingdom or in the, or in the Republic of Hawaii. They're from that time, my kupuna. And so, my maternal grandmother, she, she, um, she almost lived a National Geographic life. <laughs> what, and I, what I mean by that is that she would, you know, oh, he, oh, her own limu, and I still fondly recall her in her mu'umu'u. You know, those days, women did not wear pants. They all wore, you know, mu'umu'u or dresses. And she'd go into the kai, she'd go, oh, he, her limu. She'd clean her limu right there. And then she coming out of the water, lifting up her mu'umu and all that water, all dripping off. And then, you know, she, she'd put the, uh, the cleaned limu in jars. Uh, you know, we used to get um, the hanger and then get vana. And then, you know, the hem all the kukuna you know, and all this kind of stuff. And um, um, my grandmother, when her friends came over the house, like largely from Bakua Ranch or Ohikilo, other places, they spoke Hawaiian liberally. And... My, my, my grandmother did so many things Hawaiian. And that's where I get um, my first uh, sounds, I think, into my brain and into my ears and into my mouth from my grandmother. And so it, you know, just, just being there with her was my first experiences of learning things Hawaiian, not realizing I was learning anything, but I was. But she's gonna die, die you know, very, very young. 
in my life. I'm going to be about five or six years old where she dies. But my Hawaiian learning does not stop there. It's going to go on. And, and maybe later on this evening, you know, I will, I will explain how that happens. But those are my first recollections of um, Hawaiian culturally based learning was just having it around me. Mahalo nui kima, what a beautiful story to share from your tutu and picking limu on the west side. Do any of our other panelists want to jump in and share your first uh, Hawaiian culture learning experience that you recall in Amaka? Uh, uh, yeah, so mahalo for that, um, Kimo, your story. And I think about, you know, the as a young girl uh, attending a funeral and, um, and when we had uh, the hearing the, the, you know, wailing and the, you know, way, ha'u way, and that kind of bringing up and, but being comfortable with, with the uh, kino there. Um, and like kind of what you were saying, kind of being around that, but not realizing that we're learning, but that was family um, experience of that sad but in some way joyful in that that's what i i recall very very early young young girl those sounds of the old level very kind of spooky for some of us to hear the chanting in that style but wow what a memory thank you for sharing that okay i'll go next thank you um <clears throat> so Dad was from Kohala, from a little place called Niuli'i, and uh, sort of born and raised in that Lavai'a kind of tradition. So unfortunately, he was also old school. So if he got things wrong, like if you didn't know the difference between a veo veo or uu or kumu or vekeula, you got a whack. Yep. And so the old style is to take your child down to the shoreline or put him in the water and then you are told as a child to go and identify what you can't see the fish so you you just have to identify the type of water it is and the kind of fish that might be possible in that water and if you got it wrong whack so that's how i was raised yeah Oh, interesting. Mahalo for sharing that story from New Lee. Hey, Kalehua. Hey, I live in Iloko. I aloha ina kanako na kai evalu. For when I was, um, I, I usually bring up my grandmother. Her name is Irene Pao Jellings, but she's a uh, blood duva shell. And uh, she uh, was actually uh, one of the kahu um, in uh, Kamauna Oliveta Church in Waikane. And so uh, when I was young, and that's kind of like a, a subsidiary of Kiakua Maurua, Kahalipuri Kiakua Maurua. And so uh, within those practices, and uh, I just was getting this question asked to me, like, how, how did you, you know, get interested or feel comfortable in cultural spaces or in Olalo Hawaii? And I always tie it back to the experiences of um, the Halipule uh, Maku'u Valili'i. And so my grandmother would always... Um, it was really important to her to be in places like that. And um, some of the experiences within the church, uh, not to get too specific, uh, were blended experiences. And so because of those blended experiences and because of the Allah uh, in Olao Hawaii and all of the sermons in Olao Hawaii, um, I think I became uh, more acclimated um, to some of uh, what potentially uh, I became acclimated to be comfortable in situations that some would find um, uncomfortable in the, our world today, but I give it to her, I, uh, Tutu uh, Irene. Oh, Mahalo for calling her into the room tonight. Oh, yeah. So, you know, in summary, I think all four of you shared mo'olelo or stories from your childhood, from family experiences, from Tutu in the ocean to Papa in the ocean, and then Namaka and Kalewa, both uh, church related or, you know, ceremony type of things with the uh, Halipule. And, I wasn't surprised to hear that all of you were citing your ohana as that first foundation for your Hawaiian cultural experience, which is how most people might learn Hawaiian culture. I think today there's a, it's a different generation where all kids are not raised in the same settings and do not have those experiences. 
some still still do of course and i know like for even for funerals a lot of kids their parents don't take them to funerals anymore right it's scared not like and so they might not even go to those things so um tonight's discussion will be reflecting back on these practices and looking at maybe perhaps towards the end of our discussion how our schools and our our public schools private schools kind of take the place of some of these uh cultural experiences that many of us might have gotten at home from family but now attend programs and schools to receive a similar education. Thank you so much. Okay, let's jump into this uh, thing. I wanted to actually ask our, our panelists to help us get more familiar with the term Hawaiian culture-based education and maybe define it a little bit. This could take the whole panel to talk about what does it mean, right? What is Hawaiian culture-based education? But if a one or two of you wanna take a stab, but basically what exactly is Hawaiian culture-based education? What, what does this term mean to you? Uh, part of that question would be also perhaps, do we, any of us know who coined this term or when it started, you know, being used more popularly uh, in the last maybe 20 or 30 years? I think it's a relatively new term, but um, does anybody want to take a stab at helping us to define and give us a definition of this term or in culture-based education? Okay, okay. <laughs> um... I'm not going to do the technical definition that I already wrote in some article somewhere else, but basically, we get to use the wisdom of our kupuna uh, in a way to help our uh, keiki, our haumana, um, learn to grow. And um, that growth process is more than just the intellect. It is in our now, is in our being and our spirituality. It is in the way we communicate both in Ola Hawaii and, and English and Japanese, Japanese and all of that. It's a way that we can help grow our strength as a people. And I think uh, to your second question about where it got started, I think uh, there are lots of places and people who have contributed to these, the definitions we know of today, like Sean Kana'i Puni and Keiki Kawai'i and a bunch of other people who have done a lot of work in that. So I just, I think that's what we teach our Keiki to strengthen themselves through who we are. Mahalo for sharing that. Thank you for uh, mentioning Keiki and Sean of Maika'ilua Polole. Anybody else want to add to that? You know, I I I want to I want I want to uh, throw in something. You know, I I started my teaching career in DOE, and actually I am a uh, I'm a social studies certified teacher for a secondary social studies. Um, the the only thing I I really taught at in those years that even touched anything Hawaiian was the modern history of Hawaii course, and um. In, in, in the seventh grade um, Hawaiian monarchy course. And that's about it. I was not allowed to teach like Hawaiian language or anything else because I didn't have the, um, the college credits or the certification for it. But uh, there was, um, so, but even though I did not teach it in those years, you know, H Hawaiian, um, Hawaiian knowledge, I think there is the presence of a Hawaiian teacher, no matter what you are teaching, that is different from teachers from other cultural backgrounds. In that, um, like let's say in my US uh, history and government class, there are certain things that you're gonna do in my class and certain things that you're not gonna do because I am Hawaiian. And, uh, and I'm, going to, I, I'm going to teach you in this Hawaiian way. I think one of the ways that we teach best in a Hawaiian way is through mo'olelo. Whether it's um it's Hawaii, a Hawaiian mo'olelo or even a mo'olelo about the United States, and and that's how that's how I learned, and so that's how I naturally started to teach everything that I taught, even if it was world history, or or consumer education. It was from that um Hawaiian presence and that Hawaiian style of teaching and handling your class. You know, I never did have, I never really did have a disciplinary problem. I think I was the principal's, um, pri I was the principal's joy. Nobody came to the office because, you know, I would let them have it right then and there. And I saw Hawaiians on. I'm going to lick you now before I forget. 
and is you know it's not a, this you know assertive discipline or you know oh John I'm gonna write your name on a chalkboard. No, John, you're gonna haul you're gonna haul your colleague outside this class. So I'm gonna deal with you now. And you know then and so you know those kinds of things like how we were brought up. Those are the things that I brought into the classroom, and I think that's part of um, um being Hawaiian based. Um, teaching too, whether it's a it's a Hawaiian subject or not. And when I went into the uh, the teaching uh, a field, there were very few of us Hawaiians who who were teaching. And when people found out I was a teacher, they, they either asked me if I taught music, and I said no, or they saw my keys around my neck if I taught PE, and you know you have to no. And then when I told them no, I teach U.S. history and government, they went into shock. But um, there is a Hawaiian approach and a presence to teaching anything, whether it's a Hawaiian subject or not. Mm. Mahalo. Mahalo nui, Mikai. I was gonna keep the, that question I, on the table for now, eh, Namaka? Well, I, I was just gonna add when, um, uh, to that, uh, the discussion about, you know, Hawaiian presence. And that's what we didn't have. We didn't see enough of that in our schools. The, the reflection for our students in the images of teachers. And so like you're describing chemo very, there were hardly any of our teachers teaching in, in you know, teaching at the time. Um, so I think that's this this Hawaiian culture based education comes about as we're lifting and um, you know and lifting up our own uh, cultural ways of of being and understanding in education. So um, yeah, I think I think that also describes culture-based education is that there's a reflection of us for our, for our teachers. Our teachers and students have that, um, see themselves in the classroom. Yeah, real quick, Manuel, because I just wanted to kind of add in that um, uh, for, for myself, uh, when I enter into the space, it's really about the definition of culture too. And so um, being able to understand that <clears throat> our ancestors uh, lived here for a long time, you know, and represented the uh, uh, human species uh, in this geographic area. And they, and they ran uh, what I, you know, what I, I coined as a longitudinal study. And they studied our land um, and they studied um, the environment and they really utilized those, um, Avina, those lessons that they learned from nature uh, to design the culture. And so that's the derivative of research and so uh, when we do say Hawaiian culture-based education it is uh, what's encapsulated in there are behaviors that come from millennia of studying na the natural world and then um you know the and centralizing that focus of our connectivity and our belonging to land uh, our responsibility to land in that and in, in all that we do and then um basically uh, utilizing all of that in a contemporary uh space right now to centralize focus on that so that developmentally speaking children can be moved through um, a Hawaiian identity uh, first and so whenever we utilize um, you know we curriculum development or in any sort of um, instruments that go into this space of um, Hawaiian culture-based education that we start from a Hawaiian space and, and Hawaiian defined by um, the, the level of understanding and knowledge of the individual that's actually the instructor but being able to um, put Hawaii first, put Hawaiian culture first and start there and let that be the, um, the entry point or the access point by which we see the rest of the world and engage with other forms of knowledge. So that would be just my addition. That's and, a wonderful, wonderful. And, right, hey, namaka. I, and you know what, Kalihua, with, with, with everything that he just said, that's what we lift up in this 10, well, this past 10 years, o Hawaii ke kahua o kahua o wow, that our Hawaii is from the foundation of our na'awau, our knowledge and our enlightenment is from the kahua of Hawaii. So right on. And <laughs> too often 
we were told that we couldn't, we shouldn't, right? We had to learn the ways of American life or whatever, English, social studies, science. But if we don't start from home, if we don't start from here, our kids get disenfranchised. We did teach math from our standpoint, our knowledge bases, our Ike, yep. Because all math that can be taught now can be, um, the starting point can be with the wisdom of our kupuna. It does not have to start with two trains passing in the night going like this. That's, our kids don't even know what a train is. Right, so if we start at home and we branch out, we can build the bridges for our kids so that they can see themselves in, um, you know, the very technical world of engineering and astronomy and all of those kinds of things because they know who they are here, right? So I, I just love what everybody is saying, and and it, and every everything is is so true. Because a lot of times it's true, Walter, you know, things are so foreign to our kids because, um, well, they're not created here. But, you know, at Punahou School, last year, I had the wonderful um, opportunity to teach fourth and fifth graders. I've never taught them in my whole life. But the other year, you know, um, they needed somebody. And so I just raised up my hand. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like, I like, I like chai, I like chai. So stupid. Yeah, no, but it was actually wonderful. I had 200 fourth graders and 200 fifth graders. And they and they um and they came to me once a cycle. We have cycles that run every six days. And so I'm I'm teaching them about 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 Punahou and and our land. You know we're so we're so um we're so blessed with a beautiful historical school and land. There was it's there was actually one girl who raised up her hand and she asked, "Why are we learning this?" Okay, inside me, I wanted to slap her, but I had to, I had to you know, I had to be nice. And, and, I, and I told her, well, you know, we, we all have this shared experience of um, Punahou School. And not only that, we all have this shared experience of living in Hawaii. And, you know, we live in a place that's so unique and it's so unlike any place else in the whole world. And you come to me so that I can share this experience with you. And she was, uh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, she was, she was Asian. I, I don't know what kind of Asian um, she was, but, but she was, but she had, I mean, she wasn't getting cocky or sassy, but she just wanted to know, you know, what the hell are we learning this for? And so um, I, I managed to reason with her that she was a part of something very special. And that's why she's come. And then when she came to me every week and I told all of them, I'm gonna teach you exactly like how I teach my own family because you are my own family. And when I tell you, you know, aloha, you know, and I ask them what it means and, you know, someone is a hello and all this kind, but there's a few kids that say love, I say that, that's right. And I said, in, in the word aloha, the first three letters, A, L, and O is alo. That means you are in my presence. And I acknowledge every one of you in my presence because you are all very important to me. And so when you say aloha back to me, you acknowledge me in your presence. And so it is true. This is a presence that we all going to be together with, with love. And you are here to share that love, you know, amongst all of us here. And then when you go back to your regular teaching, everything else, that aloha never stops. And that's why we never, and I asked Auntie Pat Bacon one time, you know, I never heard aloha kakahiaka growing up or aloha ahiahi or, you know, those, I just heard aloha. And she gave me this explanation. She said, Kavana Pukui uh, went to Waiohinu one time and I was talking to um, uh, Uncle Fred Meineke up there and they, and they were talking about this particular subject. And um, Auntie Pat said, well, it was, it was thought that, well, if you say like aloha kakahiaka, that means at 1159, you only have one more minute where the aloha is going to be valid. And at 12 o'clock, it's avakea and there's no more aloha anymore. And I said, no wonder the Tutu folk never said those things. It was just aloha because there's, there's no expiration 
or time limit on aloha. And so, you know, when I, when I get this across to the kids, then they get it that they actually are in a land of aloha, where we acknowledge everything in our presence and everything else will acknowledge us. And then, you know, we, we respect everything around us. And, and so by the time the end of the school year comes, these kids get it. And because um, some, some, some of the kids don't have a connect because they're not from here or they're not Hawaiian. But, but uh, in our presence, you know, you are Hawaiian and being here in Hawaii is our shared experience. And so we're going to share this all as much as we can about our home um, whether you're a Hawaiian or not. Yeah. I just wanted to throw that in. Mahalo. I'm getting pulled into this beautiful mo'olelo, losing sight of my next question, actually. But I want to just take a moment to acknowledge all our viewers. We're getting lots of comments on either it's from the Facebook feed or right from Zoom. Aloha no kako. Lots of aloha coming out to our panelists here saying hello from all parts of the world, actually. So welcome to everybody who is uh, watching here tonight at our Hawaiian History Month uh, topic of Mo'oku Auhau of a movement. And we are talking about Hawaiian culture-based education as a movement. And just to try to summarize some of the um, wonderful words that have been shared, I think Namaka was saying that another way of thinking of HCBE is Ohawai ke kahua o kana'awau, that Hawaii is that foundation of our knowledge base. And in what we were sharing a moment ago, it's really like this is a decolonizing methodology to be able to deconstruct and really rebuild, deconstruct some of the mainstream Western thought that has been pretty predominant in our education system with this new way of doing uh, education in Hawaii, HCBE. Yes, definitely. I love the flow of our Everybody. evening tonight. Anybody in our panelists wanna keep talking like Kai? If not, I'm gonna go to our next question. Oh, eh. okay. So. You know, we all know each of you have contributed to Hawaiian education in your own way. Um, I want to talk about these earlier days, and we're already alluding to this, but um, if we look at our today's programs that exist, our, our Hawaiian focused charter schools, and those programs I mentioned earlier in the night, um, can we hearken back to the 1950s, 60s, 70s, maybe pre-statehood and post-statehood? Um, what were those things out there that laid the foundation for our current programs and projects that we are involved with today? What were those antecedents that were there, either programmatic things within the government or public education or to other societies? What were those foundations that were laid um, prior to the onset of these programs? Anyone know on that? Okay, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll jump in on this. I, I really, really have to give thanks to the Department of Parks and Recreation of the City and County of Honolulu for a heck of a lot that I've learned of, about uh, Hawaiian things. The Department of Parks and Recreation in uh, the days of the territory, starting from the 1930s, made a concerted effort to actually hire Hawaiians as um, park directors and at the, and their individual programs, they taught things Hawaiian, whether it was quilting, um, Hawaiian seed craft, alohala weaving, Hawaiian singing, hula, ukulele. I mean, all, all kinds of things Hawaiian. And uh, they started what was called the playground quarter hour, which was a live, Hawaiian music show on KGU radio that broadcasted every Saturday for a quarter hour, 15 minutes. And so every playground would um, bring on participants from their playground. They learned these Hawaiian songs. And, and in those days, when you learned a Hawaiian song, you had to memorize everything. You did not, you did not have, you, you could not use a paper. You had to remember all the words and the phrasing and the correct melodies. And you had people that worked at the Department of Parks and Recreation that knew their stuff, like uh, Mrs. Alice Namakelua. Uh, there was a, a Mrs. Alice Kalahui, who became uh, the head of the music and dance department. And they had strict quality control. 
And so when you went to a, a playground to teach your classes, you had to sing the song in front of Mrs. Kalahui just to make sure that you're going to sing the right melody with the right phrasing with the correct words. And so this went on for decades. And um, the parks programs were very, very um, well attended. They're, I mean, they, they serve thousands of people, at least here on the island of Oahu. And every playground, if it was a hula program there at your playground, you would have a, you would have a recital and, and the music had to be light. And there were strict rules. You cannot, you cannot wear anything artificial. You cannot, you cannot use like cellophane skirts. Any, it had to be the real deal. And my hula mother, uh, Adeline Lee, she was the daughter of Thomas Mamunu Paul Sr. She was a teacher with the Department of Parks and Recreation from 1950 to 1979 um, uh, when she retired. And so th that's, that's the uh, background that I have is is seeing these uh, parks programs that kind of save things Hawaiian for us when the Renaissance would come later on. And so by the time the Renaissance actually came, I didn't quite understand it because um, I, I did not go to hula and all this stuff, you know, as a once a week kind of thing, but it was all the time. And so it, it was really, really interesting for me. But as a concerted effort for teaching things Hawaiian, I, I really here on the island of Oahu, I have to credit the Department of Parks and Recreation of the city and county of Honolulu. Makai, I was gonna ask that question a little bit later on in terms of those teachers in these earlier programs. It sounds like they were also native Hawaiian, in this case, Wahine. Was that a theme that you saw growing up, Timo, and others on the panel? Were these first teachers in programs such as at the Parks Department, were they Native Hawaiians and were they predominantly Wahine Kumu, Wahine teachers? Uh, in my case, that they were predominantly Wahine. And um, the DOE, as a matter of fact, uh, in, in the early years of the territory, they made it a concerted effort to go and recruit Native Hawaiian women to be teachers. So during, during my, like my parents' time, okay, my father is born in 1919 and my mother is born in 1924. When they went to school in, in the, throughout the, their younger years, their teachers were predominantly Hawaiian. It's because they went to go and recruit Hawaii. It, it was felt by um, Dr. Wist and, and many others in the territory that Hawaiian women had this natural, this natural love for children. And so they recruited Hawaiian women on purpose. So I think that feeling um, was felt throughout the city and county as well. We're going to recruit Hawaiian women, you know, who, 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 knew, who knew things Hawaiian as well as how to uh, run programs and things. In my lifetime, okay, for example, at, at Paki Playground, there was Mrs. Rosalie Gahan and she ran Paki, but she was also a Lauhala weaver. And then at Wilson Playground, which is later going to become known as Papakolea Playground, that's going to be Auntie Meli Ikalama. And she, of course, you, everybody knows her as a, a famous quilter. And so you're going to have these kinds of people, you know, uh, set into place in our playgrounds. And then every Wednesday, these um, playground directors are going to come together and meet at the Alawai Clubhouse because they're going to form the the Parks and Recreation Glee Club, where they are going to learn new songs so that they can take back to their playgrounds and also to um, put on the playground quarter hour. And so there's gonna be a, quite a bit of a purpose, purposeness and um, training and ongoing professional development. And then along the way, of course, they have Alice Namakilua on their staff until 1959, but even after she retires, she's still going to be active. Then you're going to have Mrs. Mary Kavena Pukui, who is going to um, teach them uh, her songs. And um, Mr. John K. Almeida, who's also going to be instrumental in bringing his songs to the uh, Parks and Recreation Department and also composing songs, especially for them and their programs. It was really a nifty and, and um, wonderful time. And I was really, really blessed that during my lifetime, you know, I, I knew these people. And so now they seem like they're kind of like fairy tales or legends. 
but absolutely hardworking, hard loving people. Mahalo. This is Hawaiian History Month, and here we are laying it down. Really awesome mo'olelo that is being shared here. I love it. I love it. I'm I'm listening, you know, Kiwa, and your the ages are same as my mama and um uh papa, you know, just uh the same years, but very different here on um uh, on our island. We you know we we did have we we grew up right in Keoka, right across the street from where we grew up. We did have uh, what we had the Hawaiian village where um, we had our arts people people uh, that would have lauhala weaving and um, uh, those kinds of but not nothing like Honolulu where you have and I understand you even had competition yeah for music competitions um, song song competitions is that what also occurred over there yeah so yes. that's really I think what we had but i think that was a part of the department of education the um uh kupuna in the in the public schools that that program was for a while during i guess that would probably be in the in the 70s yeah kind of late already it wasn't in uh in the 60s but there, there was that kupuna program um here so it's very different that's very fortunate that you had that experience with the, your the PNR Parks and Recreation over there. I think that's how when we talk about the Mary Monica Auntie Luana, um, Luana talks about the you know beginnings was through the Parks and Recreation um, program that the that her mama and um, Uncle George and Ope were uh, the beginnings of that. We we hear that story too of the Mary Monica starting with Parks and Recreation. I think the uh, the DOE, the uh, Hawaiian Studies program, or the Kupuna component, got its start around 1984 officially. But I think prior to that, they were experimenting with having Kupuna in the classroom. But I think 1984 is a year that the program was officially uh, launched within the DOE with local Maika'i Snakenberg and others at that time. Um, but great to hear these stories. You know, we realize how pivotal the parks departments, the city and county government was here on Oahu at least. And thank you, Namaka, for sharing your experiences growing up on East Hawaii. Um, I get, you know, a, um, hearkening back to the song competitions. Back in 1950, it was seen that um, the art of Hawaiian musical composition was already waning. And so that's why the um, Department of Parks and Recreation started the Hawaiian Songwriting and Composing Contest. And it, and it went strong for about maybe uh, 25 years or so. And then we're, we are going to see, you know, Mrs. Pukui entering her songs. She has quite a bit of songs that she composed both the words and the music that not too many people have heard. Um, John K. Almeida is going to be um, one of those who's going to enter the song contest. Um, Val Kepelino. I mean, all kinds of people are going to... And it, because it was seen as, as early as 1950 that this is a dying art. And so the, that contest was started. And the, the KGU Radio Playground Quarter Hour is actually going to uh, run all the way through the 1960s. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be one of those um, kid singers on that radio program during, during its uh, closing years going upstairs to the third floor of the advertiser building where the studio was and you know, singing old Hawaiian songs. And we learned very old Hawaiian songs, a lot of them from the 19th century. And I, I just recently figured out why, because I taught a course at UH Manoa this past summer on 19th century Hawaiian uh, poetry and music. And I was wondering, how come I learned so many damn old songs? And then I figured it out. Those people were still alive when I was alive, you know, in, in the 1960s. They're like my tutu folks, you know, they were born in the Hawaiian kingdom. Those are the songs that they wanted to hear. And those are the songs that they loved. 
And that was largely um, the audience that we drew when we sang at the, the old um, Capilla, Queen Capilani Park bandstand and on the radio and elsewhere. And so, you know, I've been uh, very grateful for that opportunity and very grateful that these people from the Hawaiian kingdom live through my, through my lifetime. And I remember one time, uh, you first remember Auntie Lydia Mayoho, Auntie Namahana at the Royal Mausoleum. One time she told me, hey, you know, Kimo, somebody, so-and-so came to the mausoleum today and asked if I knew you. And she, and she said, yeah, I know Kimo. She said, I know what he looks like naked. And he looked at her and said, why, what you mean? She goes, I used to change his diapers. So, you know, she was, that's the kind of babysitters I had. I mean, you know, people who take care of the royal data, you know, all this kind of stuff. It was just, that was the, the absolute best Hawaiian cultural based education, I think anybody could have had. And, um, well, I just wanted to throw that in. Mahalo. <laughs> I, I think you're a child prodigy, Kimo, like there you threw ukulele on stage at Keiju Radio performing. I think you're also that link from the, the kupuna to who we are today, having that bridging those years and being at the right time at the you know, right place, right time kind of situation over the years. I was going to ask, you know, um, we were speaking of this earlier period in the 50s, uh, then the 60s, and um, I think of statehood in 1959 and the transformation from a territory to statehood. And has that maybe impacted Hawaiian culture-based education of that era? But I was, here's a question for our panelists, though. What do you think are the watershed moments or moment that help redefine or revitalize or strengthen Hawaiian culture in Hawaii? Was there, was there some kind of turning point that you recognize either in your own experience or in your own historical research and knowledge? So I'm gonna take a step. So I'm a child of the 70s. In fact, uh, I graduated in the last year of the 70s. Um, you know, uh, Kimo was talking a little bit about the Renaissance period. What I only can remember is uh, actually the issues that were being raised, the politicking, and unfortunately the fighting that we had to do in order to protect the lands that we um, were on but getting evicted from, the building of Kalama Valley, um, you know, the watershed issues. I live in um, a small ili, Ahui Manu, and we are affected in this Kahalu'u and Waiahole, Waikani area by the watershed and the lack of, right? So as a person who grew up, grows up during the 70s, these critical issues, especially um, our fight for our rights become very pivotal because for somebody like me who was told as a young child, because, uh, you know, half Kepani and half Hawaiian, don't be Hawaiian, don't be like your father, don't grow up like that because you know Hawaiians are good for nothing. It's a hard time when you hear that uh, that being that sentiment being repeated over and over again. So I think part of the deal is that um, you know those of us who grew up during that period of time, we began realizing that if we don't, start really pushing forward and fighting for the rights that we we need to have um we're going to get stamped out and and that in part now is why teaching our kumu who are out there in the field touching the lives of hawaiian children every day it is important to help them understand not just the the critical nature of teaching um through culture and language, but now the urgency to do so because we are now very distant from the use of Ola Hawaii in everyday conversation. And we're trying to push forward so that that becomes something you can go and uh, go to Ala Moana or Safeway or wherever, Costco, and you're gonna hear it echoed in those, in those aisles. So, um, the politics, I think, of the 60s and the 70s, um, especially the fight for right, the sovereign rights that, that we're enjoying today um, are, all, are pivotal. 
I would I wouldn't add to that Manuai too because I think at that time um I would be remiss if we don't talk about um the bombing of Pearl Harbor Pulua if we don't talk about um the bombing of Kaho'olawe because I think uh centralized at the revitalization movement was uh trauma and loss um and maybe it wasn't conceptualized in that way but it seems as though that at the turn of the century as you move through the 1920s, 1930s, and then the, the warmongering of America, um, the driving of um, the economic drive that uh, war provided us in that, in that um, current context, um, set the stage to actually uh, move forward detached from kupuna and move forward detached from ancestry. And because that's the actual time that uh, you see language loss um, in at levels that, um, the elders of that time never saw before and they never felt. And you see the, the metropolis uh, being uh, erected and the loss of lands and you start to see the endangered species go extinct and you start to see the land, uh, the waters um, and the reefs begin to dry up. And I think that at that turn in 1950s and 60s was a, an, an environmental turn too um, that began to provide a space of um, fear, a little trepidation for those that could remember the days of plenty and could remember the days of um, how, how uh, Hawaii should look under the, the guidance of our ali'i and of our ways. And so they could remember that. And because they could remember that, they started to feel, um, um, again, that sense of urgency uh, to, to actually step out of their comfort zones and enter into spaces of teaching because um, they knew that the language, the mele, the dance, um, our behaviors, our ways um, were integral to being able to um, help salvage and and um, save our aina from the damage that was being recorded during those times. Uh, Kalehu, I'm glad you brought that up because I remember very vividly. I was um in uh, high school at Kamehameha, like when um uh, Kalama Valley was was happening, and then later on, you know, um the Sand Island evictions and you know all uh, all those things were happening and I think um like my parents generation even the kupuna they felt helpless that they, they couldn't do anything to to stop any of this so it was uh, like the generation like of my age you know that that uh, started to develop the courage to you know to look look at government and uh, developers in the face and say you we've had enough and you're gonna have to stop this. And so, the, you know, there were the Walter Riddies and, you know, and, and all of them, yeah, um, taking care of that part. And then the role that I think my um, parents and grandparents generation uh, took, at least the people around me say, well, you know, we're, we're losing a hell of a lot of stuff. And so we're gonna try our best to go and and um, you know teach the the the, the melee and, and the music and I'm and I'm lucky that I had a head start to all of this, but one of the things that I I saw that was kind of bad about the Hawaiian Renaissance was that uh, we we're going to see a lot of we're going to see a lot of people like maybe my generation and younger, they're going to start to um take a lot of Hawaiian practices out of context. And uh, the Hawa our Hawaiian culture is not a buffet. You cannot say, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I'm not going to take the rest. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, if, if you are going to be sincerely interested in fishing, for example, uh, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to take the, the moors and, and all the rules and regulations that go along with fishing Hawaiian style. So when the, the, the Lavaya goes out, well, people on land have their uh, role too. You know, there's no fighting in the house. There's no this, you know, you just uh, be quiet and all this kind of stuff. And um, we're going to start seeing, um, I, wanna say, I wanna say fanatics with, with our culture. And a lot of things that like, for example, I think uh, chanting Kunihi Kamauna is a good example of what people started to say, well, you know, it's, a, it's in the uh, Pele mythology. And so, you know, we're, we're going to you know, begin this and begin that, and we're going to use Kunihi. But, but that is something that is, was taken out of context. And it still is, I think, for a lot of people. Um, that No, this is something that you do not use for secular kinds of um, occasions. Only when there's things that are involving kapu do you use Kunihi Kamauna. And I know that. 
because of, of my hula training. And then when, when there's things that are couple, of course, you're going to have to, you know, release that couple with, you know, the whole no. And especially when you're working with children, you know, Hawaiians will always say, you got to be careful. Otherwise, you know, the innocent get caught with stuff, whether it's the young kids or, you know, um, people who are just weak. So uh, we, we saw uh, quite a bit of that kind of stuff, uh, people taking stuff out of context. And, and that isn't good. But what is good is that there is, um, I think people are beginning to, well, well, not beginning to, but are fully realizing that we do have a, so much to uncover and so much to learn and relearn and to share. And to me, that's exciting. Very, very exciting. And so I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a part of this excitement and all of you are exciting and I'm, yeah, I love it. Mahalo. I want to just uh, chime in on what Kalihua brought up earlier about Pearl Harbor. The bombing of Pearl Harbor is definitely a watershed moment. And uh, I think you alluded to this earlier, Kalihua, about the land grab that took place as a result of America's and subsequently Hawaii's entering into the World War II. And this, the land grab to justify for US national security this tale, this velo is still with us today. And as we see movements um, calling for the, to not re-up these different land leases that the state of Hawaii has, or that the, the military has for several large tracts of land in Hawaii. And so as we speak about Hawaiian history, honoring the Queen's legacy, it's so important to remember that history is not just one incident. It has this generational impact, generational trauma um, that our people have encountered and we still are battling with this. And so for, for me, I think Hawaiian culture-based education is one of those decolonizing methodologies for us to really start, at least at the, in our home and at schools, to be able to share history and culture. This brings us to the next question. And it's really, I think uh, it was about what Kimo said as well, about compartmentalizing things and taking things um, out of context and maybe teaching this, but not teaching that. and um, there is this idea, and I think Kimo also spoke about in the County Parks and Recreation Department, the, the crafts that were being taught, the singing, the mele, the lauhala, these things that we really honor, these material aspects of our culture, these practices. Um, I'm wondering to what degree, if at all, was Hawaiian history taught when it comes to Hawaiian culture in those earlier days? And as for today, can we still teach Hawaiian culture without teaching Hawaiian history? So sometimes we tend to like, have a safety zone where we can do hula and mele because it's nani, it's nahe nahe. But let's not talk about the overthrow. Let's not talk about our, our polluted waters and how that came to be. What do you guys feel about that in terms of uh, the teaching of Hawaiian history along with Hawaiian culture? Is there a place for Hawaiian, cult Hawaiian history in Hawaiian culture-based education? I uh, talk. The eyes. Oh, go, 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 go ahead. Go ahead, Kimo. Kimo. No, go you ahead. go first because you're prettier. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, okay. I, I'm going to turn the question a little bit. Um, I think there, there isn't enough time left in our lives, I think, especially for somebody like me, not to combine Oleo Hawaii, Ike Hawaii. You know, the Mo'omehu, Piko'u, the whole nine yards all together in every, I think Kimo alluded to this, you can teach it in every content area. Because when we start with that, we are training not just our Kanaka, but all of the island's Kanaka together in a way of thinking, of being, of, of believing, of understanding each other. Um, that is really going to be a gift, not just to Hawaii, but to the rest of the world. That sense of aloha that Kimo brought up is going to be really critical. So I'm, I'm trying to say, you know, it, it, we can't afford not to be able to do all of these pieces together. And we can't afford not to do this in every, every class, every course, every start at home. Start with the power of the 
you know, the native peoples of these islands and the world will be a whole lot better place. So that's my philosophy. I, I'm going to add to that. I mean, we are talking about history, you know, separating or does it come with the culture? Uh, yesterday is history. Today is already history. Every day we're living in the history. The moment is the history. So, you know, um, cannot help but but teach it. We can't help, but we have to teach it. We have to know it. We have to know that, you know, this is, we're exercising sovereignty. We're exercising our sovereignty, even though, did they dub us? Are we sovereign? Did we say we are? We said, who doesn't matter that we we don't have the official, but we're we're exercising our sovereign rights, and um, and we have to believe it. Oh, just because I what, what who who are you to tell me if I got it? No, I'm telling you, I have it. That's that's our sovereign, you know. And I'm I I'm just gonna you know the everything um the purpose. Uh, and setting up these, the, the, you know, the history, the whole, the history along, you know, our, the queen and, and continuing to get up to, you know, in this month of the history and going back up to Congress and, you know, getting, trying to get back her, her kingdom, get back the kingdom. And, and we, here we are today, we're still, we still, we never said we gave, we gave it up. We never said it was, we're done. You know, we have, the queen and and I remember someone saying, "Oh, you know, she she passed in 1917. She passed in 1917 during the territorial pe period. She she continued. We still had a monarchy. We still had we're we're a sovereign nation, and so we talk about it like that. We have we still we have our language. We have our you know we're still." And we're pushing at it, so it's not that it's it's we're all it's all wonderful and everything is all honky dory aole. We're we're we we're having to exercise our rights, and so you know that's that's history. Like I said, that's part of the history, and this is every day that we're living it. We're living history. We're not. We're still here. No, that that is true. That is, true. you know, um, when I was in DOE, and I and I taught the modern history of Hawaii course uh, to freshmen, we had a wonderful set of of uh, materials that was fairly new. I think it was called the Shaping of Modern Hawaiian History, and I've never seen a Hawaiian history curriculum that actually addressed like um, the evils of the Big Five, or even the overthrow, and you know, and and topics like that. And that, that was very, very important for our kids to know that, you know, th this is what had happened or even, even how come, you know, I, you ask the kids, you know, how many of us in this class, you know, hapapake, you know, part Chinese? Well, I'll tell you why you are, you know, can I say that? And I am too. Plus I'm hapapukiki and, you know, and, and this is, this is what we are and who we are. And this is how come, you know, we're it. And so, and so the, the kids actually uh, found it quite fascinating that you know that they didn't know and another thing that i kind of threw into the curriculum too was um the internment of japanese during world war ii you know when they were in prison and i had a lot of japanese students that just couldn't believe it and so when they went home and they asked their parents and they said oh yeah but you know they didn't talk about it and i think a lot of times the same thing with our, us hawaiian people you know a lot of families just didn't talk about certain things and so, you know, when, when the kids came back and they're, you know, they wanted to learn more, you know, even a Japanese, you know, hey, how come we were in prison? But I'll tell you what happened, you know. And 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 so, you know, I think a lot of times um, when we have to personalize it, not only for ourselves and for others, like what I tell my Punahou students, hey, we live, we live here. This is our shared experience. And I want you to experience it with me. And so, you know, let's all let's all do it. And um and, and I think, um, but, but the thing too, is that we always cannot, uh, we have to be careful about victimizing ourselves and, and, and beating it to death. Because, you know, we, we know there are, a lot, there are a lot of things that, you know, um, that were very, very unfortunate that happened. But then again, there are a lot of things that are fortunate that it happened. 
and and so uh, you know to, to find I, I think um, to find those opportunities of, of how we're going to teach culture alongside history is is uh, is is a is a very very um, gosh it is it's going to take a lot of um, a choreographing and and careful planning because you you can't separate the two just like when we teach olelo hawaii you cannot separate culture from the words you know all, all these things mean something and so i think as as educators that's what that's what our um our dilemma is always going to be is when are when we're going to find those teachable moments in everything that we teach mahalo yeah i, I would add because i think um we have a, a great example of how culture and history meets and uh, on a color chemo, if uh, you know, I may, I may lift you up as that example, because as you were talking, um, it's really taking um, the time to understand the Olelo, it's taking the time um, um, to amass uh, a, a real quality amount of information about our culture, because once you get there, then you become that Pa'amu Olelo, you know, you're, you're the one that can actually um, and I use the word mo'olelo because uh, I think part of the flaw of our panel right now is we're conducting it in English and culture and uh, history uh, seem to be one and the same in our language, uh, which would be a derivative of mo'olelo. And so the mo'olelo and mo'okuaho are always important. And so I think um, ho hopefully that can kind of uh, circle it back, circle back around and tie a bow on this one that, yes, it can, because it's it was already there uh, in our ways and in our language. Um, but... Um, realizing as well that um the only way we're going to be, and, and i'm speaking you know as a uh, a principal but an educator of young children that um the only way and i you know again i lift all all three of um, um these folks um these masterful teachers uh, up right now because um the only way you can uh, formally address the pain or the or the trauma that comes with the history is to understand it so well and work so hard um, to become thoughtful and creative and innovative um, and move through the space because you cannot, uh, when, when you are not educated and when you um, don't have enough knowledge of the history, when you don't have enough knowledge of your identity and your culture, um, then that's, uh, that's um, traumatic in and of itself and you kind of get stuck. And so um, by getting more educated and working through the information and working through the truth and the history um, is the way to heal ourselves. And so, and I, and I think we have wonderful examples of that on the panel right now. I wanna add that when uh, Kimo brought up this point about young Japanese American students in Hawaii, perhaps not hearing or knowing that Japanese Americans in Hawaii and the West Coast and other parts of the US were interned. And similar to the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy, I think that these things come with lots of shame um, and parents don't want to speak about it because it was a shameful thing that happened and they're shame of it and they don't want to bring it up, especially in light of the disbelief that um, the American way of life, this uh, moral high ground that the US seems to put out that we can't believe this really happened you know, that it's really occurred that Japanese Americans were in prison because they were Japanese uh, and that our lawful government was overthrown, you know, so it comes with disbelief and some shame. And so I don't blame our kupuna for not speaking about these um, atrocities really that have occurred on this soil, you know. Taking a pause there, I wanted to say aloha to everybody who's chiming in on Zoom or Facebook or, or YouTube, amazing comments. We do want to get to some of these questions later, but um, if we have a chance to, please check out the Zoom comments. There's some really rich dialogue going on over there. Many people have echoed this idea that you cannot teach history and culture separately. Uh, so I saw that in the comments as well. So mahalo for everybody for leaning into this conversation here, Hawaiian History Month in honor of Queen Lili'uokalani. Um, keeping track of our time, because we do want to be able to take a few questions towards the end of our program here. Um, you know, in terms of outcomes, you know, if we can look, maybe look more towards contemporary times and um, our programs today, I think Hawaiian culture-based education is also a good tool, a policy tool. I think that is one reason why this term is very used, used a lot today, because it's a, a term that we can use in policy development for the Department of Education and other institutions who want to 
really explore and uh, rely on this foundation, this, this kahua of Ike Hawaii to base their learning on. And I know like for Kalehua as a po'okumu of Kawaihona, this is what it's about. It's a Hawaiian culture foundation for these youngsters learning there in Nanakuli. Um, but so um, how might we be able to, I know there's so many issues about teacher training, getting people to be able to know this stuff, to teach it. Um, what are some of the lessons that we can do to uh, really, or what can we do, the strategies to increase Hawaiian culture-based education today? I know this sits squarely in the work that we do day to day nowadays, right? What can we do to increase Hawaiian culture-based education? Money. <laughs> you know, um, oh God, I, I, don't, I don't know what year it was when I was first asked to, um, by the Kupuna program, if I would give a workshop. And I was so hila hila going, a Kupuna program? Am I that old? What? What's going on? And so I, I, I agreed that, and they wanted somebody to come in and, and teach them um, things and strategies and melee that they could use in the classroom. And so when I first went, I, I saw people there that were like my parents' generation. And I was really, really surprised. And I was, and I was hila hila. But when, you know, when I talked to a lot of them, they said that, well, you know, they didn't know, you know, how to, uh, how to do these things. They, a lot of them even moved to the continent, came back. They wanted to get into the Kupuna program. And um, it, it always seemed that it was a funding problem. And for a long time, at least 12 years, maybe 15 years, every year, once a year, I would go and do a DOE Kupuna workshop. And um, I would, I would uh, supply all the materials myself because I would use the Xerox machine at work and, you know, it, it wasn't a problem. And, and they were such delightful people, you know, to teach. And um, a lot of them could bake and cook. So that was a good trade-off. But it, it was... It always seemed that it was always a funding problem to and, and even when I was in the DOE, um, you know, try, trying to uh, um, uh, get monies down to teachers. And I, I and, you know, I, I know that uh, Walter and Kalehu can probably speak uh, better to this, to this. But to me, it, it's um, it, it comes to money. And where, where they placed uh, their priorities on, on who, who they're going to fund and why they're going to fund something. Um, you know, where the good news is that um, the, the work that so many especially the people on the panel have been doing, um, I don't know why I can remember visiting your Olala Hawaii class in, on Molokai. So it was really an interesting part, but uh, there are some good news for us. Uh, even without funds, we have been able to grow Olala Hawaii uh, to a very different place. Unlike, um, Many of our indigenous counterparts on the continent, especially our Indian, uh, our American Indian tribes, who have lost or are near to losing their last speakers, you know, we 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 did as well, but we've grown in in ways that have been phenomenal. Um, just the case of the 78 Kankan that allows us an opportunity now to recognize two languages, Hawaiian and English, that it did such a big piece for us um, in our growth as, as a people. Uh, we think about the fantastic new knowledges that are out there. For example, you know, our uh, ability as wayfinders to voyage across the, con uh, actually across the world now. And that knowledge is now becoming a part of how we learn uh, pre-calculus and calculus, right? We're, we're looking at our star diagrams as a way to understand now how uh, geography, geology, our understanding about uh, 
the makeup of our, our of our islands, what creates a mauna, those kinds of scientific things that were of the realm of Western education have context for us because our kupuna for eons knew that way before even, dare I say, the first probably white man stepped foot on our shores. We've grown a lot. And when we listen to people's narratives from other places, we sit and we think, wow, you know, um, that's, that's amazing. We have a long way to go, but we have a lot to celebrate. And I think that spirit of celebration helps because we still have generation on generation who are not connected to uh, Olelo and Olelo Hawaii or even their identity as a Hawaiian, right? Where we can sit in a conference and we have kupuna there who are saying to us, can you speak in English? Just like Kalehua just pointed out, rather than in Hawaiian. You know, the heart sinks a bit because I would rather us speak in our own mother tongue. But I understand that we have generations who have been separated from, divulged of, cut off. Right? So if we're thinking about the future, yeah, we still got a long way to go. And we have a long way to helping our own see value and more importantly uphold who we are as a people yeah and that's that's going to be very critical work for us in the future yeah mahalo that's um and i, I just i just would add um in a way because i think the struggle um is everything that everybody said uh, because it, it is kala um it, it is uh, you know being able to see ourselves in the classroom it is being able to identify, you know, what, what are um, the entry points and the opportunities in Hawaiian culture-based education that everybody can enter into because it's got to be more than just, um, you know, the populations we're talking about right now that uh, volunteer to go to university and get these degrees. It's got to be more than that. And so I think it, it always stems back to this idea of the ideologies um, that um, not only kind of frame and undergird educational systems, but it's also the, the ideologies of the administrators. And so um, being able to understand um, that in the Department of Education, you have antiquated forms of expectations and evaluation structures. You have assessments that are based upon standards that are not um, of our place. And so we already walked through the conversation that um, being from our place, and our land and our environment and our olelo are all really integral uh, to this movement forward in the Hawaiian culture-based educational movement. But I think in, in the ideolog ideological um, vein is that we've got to be able to, to um, share these um, thoughts throughout systems, especially at the leadership level. And then the leadership, the leadership has to be courageous um, to be able to step forward um, in, in innovative ways uh, with information, again, um, and look at how do we, um, and just going back to my grandmother, how do you build an environment in Kamauna Oliveta that makes, um, you know, church and Hawaiian-ness feel okay? Because many, many times though they're polar opposites. And our, and our kupuna did that really well. And I think it behooves us to, to embrace that right now in the educational pathway. And, I, and I'll be honest with you guys, I didn't get the, I didn't get the nod. Here's a salute to the system. But um, when the superintendent position was open, I applied. And, and I applied to be able to share the idea that uh, we, we can balance this idea of academic rigor uh, with uh, Hawaiian cultural excellence and that it belongs to, uh, to um, this place. And if everybody would embrace the ide ideologies of our ancestors, that Hawaii and the decision makers would look and act differently. And so, so realistically, uh, when you get to that point, um, I don't want to be, um, I don't, I don't want to be, um, you know, too short-sighted because I, I know that um, that's a hard road. Um, but I also want to be able to share that uh, when we do have a board of education, um, we have members of the board of education speak Hawaiian. When we have at least um, in a bilingual state. 
uh, we have boards of education that can speak both languages, when we have uh, superintendents that can access both languages and, and both um, uh, worldviews and both ideologies, I, I, I guarantee we won't have to make space for it. Uh, we're going to have to watch out that it's just going to take over the whole structure because it, it, it's, it's better for everyone. It's, and it's not just better for humans, it's better for our land and it's better for everything in our environment. And so I, I think that's the hard part. Um, and all of that's got to bleed out into the, the teacher training systems and the university systems is really uh, hiring for the ideologies that work well with Hawaii and then train to that ideology. Um, and not just, you know, I mean, standards-based education is, is one example that if you start with a standard, you're not starting with the, what the child knows. You're not starting with the aina. You're not starting with other things that are really important. Um, and that's and it takes courage to be able to um, investigate that and then call that out and then start to enact different behaviors within the systemic structures. Kako o kako o piha kalihua. I think um, your words um, really expresses the you know the sentiments of 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 what it of what it takes is is it is it is going to be you know brave um challenge to challenge structure to challenge the the um current structures to move with what what our needs are what our families want what our children and families need and what we want to keep so we have a, a fully identifiable and i'm going to go back to the rights, our rights as a nation, a people from this place, we are from this place and we're going to have to keep challenging. And in every single, when the Punana started in 1983, we're going to be 40 years. It was the challenge. It was, and it was just the idea of, of bringing babies with, at the time we still had the, um, Kupuna and our, you know, Tutu Lydia, just our last Kupuna that was with us when we started, um, Tutu Lydia Makuakane, Akahia Hala. So Malama Ia Kahooleva this next week with her family, but she was one of, uh, you know, from Puna. And, and so, you know, so fortunate that we had at that time, and, you know, Manuai, we had, we had people like, Manuai moved over to Molokai. They, we didn't even have, Punanale was ready to get into Kayapuni and we didn't have a Kayapuni yet, but Manuai moves over to, to Molokai and, and the family say, we're going to, you know, we'll feed you. We don't have a position yet, but we're going to get, we, let's get started. And Manuai jumps in. So all of these kinds of challenges, we got to keep pushing at it. It's not, doesn't just, you know, going to um, come out in that way, but we have to come from all angles, you know, flank them on the right, flank them on the left, um, uh, ways of doing things we can, so that we can move forward, so we can, you know, stand on our constitution that we are a, a, a state with two official languages. And even when we move up to the United Nations and the declarations on, on the rights of indigenous people and the, and the decade of our Anahulu for our indigenous languages, you know, we have the the opportunities and so how do we grow how do we grow and it is going to be incentivizing our young to become to be educated to know our history to learn to to want to be um teachers and and for and and whatever else they want to do too but you know come and learn a language and be able to contribute to to want to you know be a part of the future and taking taking us you know, to the future. So, um, so mahalo nui for that. Yeah, mahalo. You know, it does most certainly take courage and a change of a mindset. It and and uh, I, I'm just I'm just loving what, what I'm hearing. Uh, uh, but it's really 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 important to get it down to the kids, and to and to make them understand that this this is something important. And um, the, I taught I taught uh, in the UH system for about you know 22 years, and I taught uh, mostly at uh, Honolulu Community College, which what I'd like to call HCC Honolulu Correctional Center. 
And I had, you know, a lot of you know, students come to me. They, they're Hawaiian because they want to take Hawaiian. And, you know, and I taught um, ethnobotany and I taught a writing intensive class, Hawaiian literature and English. And some of these, some of these um, students, oh, these Hawaiians, you just want, you, you just want to choke them and strangle them, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but we, but we do all with love. And, and, you know, like some of them say, oh, Hawaiian is so hard. I said, what's so hard about it? Oh, blah, blah, blah. I said, you know, what's hard is English. Hawaiian got half the letters of, of, of the English alphabet. What the hell's the matter with you? You want to take something hard, take Mandarin. You want to, you want to learn how to write a million characters. I said, no, our language is not hard. It's just that what, what, what is hard is not applying yourself. And when, and when you go home, you're going to have to make that, that um, environment for you to enable you to and change your life so that you can study this. Or even like when I used to teach ethnobotany, I said, you know, when the first, when the first migrants came from the South Pacific, they had canoes maybe of, they could hold 40 people. And I used to ask them, who are you not going to bring? And so, of course, we make this wonderful list. So you're not going to bring, you know, the sick, the lame, the old, and all this kind of stuff. So what it is is that, well, we just brought the best and the brightest. And so you genetically, you have that in you. What the hell is the matter with you? You know, tap into that. And then it begins to make sense, you know, that, well, yeah, I, th that is true. You know, I, I, I can't. So, you know, sometimes it really starts at that level that, you know, uh, they're already defeated. But, and then again, you know, I just, it, take, it takes courage to, to study and to do this. It took courage for, for them to come in those canoes. They didn't know where the hell they were going, but they came. And, and, and look what, look what, you know, they've created and you're here. So that took a hell of a lot of courage. And yeah. so, you know, you just got to change that mindset around. And um, uh, I, I just love everything that you folks have been saying. Um, this, this is great. Mahalo, mahalo for all of, all of that. If I could add about the, maybe the ways in which we can help educators change Kalehua covered the leadership but I want to cover the folks who enter the classrooms and are with our children every day yep it is not enough for us to just change the curriculum content so oh I'm teaching a Hawaiian thing and that's how we're studying biology Kimo talked about how we we have to come from a Hawaiian way of teaching that pedagogy has also changed and shift. Yep. And Kalehua talked about the assessment tools that we use to gauge success for our kids. That too has to shift. And the environment in which we teach our kids, that learning environment has to go beyond the four walls of a traditional classroom. We have to take our kids outside. So they begin to kilo. They begin to do things that are are super powerful for our people, but learn things about the environment and how to observe things that are happening outside of the, the perennial four-walled classroom. Yeah. Uh, these shifts also come with a dispositional shift. We have to think about how we are of support to the, to the identity of this child. We're not, they, these children are not the half full or half filled thing um, that you pour your knowledge base, your, your Asian or your American knowledge bases into them. These kids already come with a ton of knowledge from home. Make the connections to home, make the connections to the community. Those five things, the content, the pedagogy, the way we teach, the instruction, the way we assess the kids, the way we build these learning environments that are beyond classroom space, and then our own disposition in the ways in which we approach this whole process of educating. Those five things can change. We're better equipped now to understand not just why Hawaiian culture-based education works for our kids, but more importantly, the need for it. And there is an urgent need for it. So I just wanted to add that. Mahalo, Luya, Okuapo. 
I, I wouldn't jump in just real Yo. fast because I want to make it tangible that, um, you know, for uh, the developmental stages of children, it's really about schools um, putting kids on the land when they're young and and having uh, teaching them how uh, uh, the dirt feels, um, how it um, smells, watching plants grow, speaking to plants and 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 learning how to feel because they don't have uh, the difficulties that we have. And if you ask, like, if you just ask a child, you know, should we, should we build a housing complex and drive out a flock of pueo or should we take care of pueo? They're going to take, they're going to choose a pueo every time. They understand their decision-making is, hasn't become human centric like us as adults. And so um, if you ask the children, when you develop that and enhance that in that, in that space and help to shepherd that um, at every level of development, but at, at that level it really sets them ahead ideologically speaking because their worldview um, becomes more solid and stable by eight to nine years old and i'll share that with schools oh i, I love that kalewa because that's true because even at punahou we have an outdoor education program and all the kids you know have their mala and everything and, and we even have ducks and 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 they get it the kids get it and then when they get to the academy we, we for a couple of years now we had our own va. And it, and it was a project of one of our senior students. And we have um, Kaniela uh, Lyman Mersberg and uh, Kealohi Rapoon. And then, you know, they have the, they're, they're taking the kids onto the va. They're, they're taking them on, you know, out into the kai. And, and this, is, this is very, very important. And, um, and you're right, by the time the kid is like eight or nine years old, it, it's, a, it's, a part of, it's a part of their whole makeup. And um, I even I even tell the kids at Puno School because we we get our own water from our own springs, so we don't we don't get water from from the city really. We pump our own. So I tell the kids every time you know you fill up your water uh, flask, you know you take in a part of the aina with you, and it's not you know jet fuel. You know it's it's Puno water. It, it's it's you know made by Kane. So what does that tell you? And, and but the kids get it, and I'm so glad that we're getting them to at a younger, younger age, so that they're gonna grow with this, and they're gonna share it with their parents, and and others, and and you know all this beauty is just so contagious, and I'm and I'm loving it, you know. Mahalo so much for that. Mahalo piha ya pao. I'm gonna ask Le Maile to wind it down. You know. This is concluding our panel, Mo'oku Ohau of a movement. I feel like our cup runneth over. We feel fulfilled. These beautiful Mo'olelo and insights into Hawaiian education. Mahalo to each and every one of our panelists tonight for being a leader, a server, and for being a kumu. You know, in the essence, you are a kumu, and we appreciate you for what you do. Mahalo nunui. And to all of our visitors tonight, thank you so much for staying up late. Uh, those of you who are on the continent, come home. We look forward to re reconnecting with all of you here in Hawaii. I wanna just um, wind up the night with a few announcements here. Uh, Friday night, September 16th at 6 p.m. we have our next panel, Ke Olino Ne Malama Lama, HCBE in the future, where my colleague Ka'anui Wak will be moderating a panel uh, discussing emerging trends and challenges facing Hawaiian culture-based education. So that'll be like the part two of tonight's discussion. I think we just kind of scratched the surface on this. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Lay Miley or Courtney to drop the link to RSVP so you can get the link sent to your email. And you can join real quickly that way come Friday night. Um, and I also want to thank some of our, all of our sponsors, our, the Hawaii Pono E Coalition. I want to mahalo Kamehameha Schools, the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs, Papa Ola Lokahi, uh, the UH Manoa John A. Burns School of Medicine, the Department of Native Fine Health in particular. Ahahui Onakauka, Center for Biographical Research at Uni University of Hawaii at Manoa, also Hawaii Nui Akea School of Hawaiian Knowledge at UH Manoa, uh, the Department of Theater and Dance at Manoa, and uh, Hawaii Youth Upper Chorus, Olelo Community Media, and OEV TV. These are our main sponsors that we want to thank tonight for our panel. Um, many more people contributed to this cause of Hawaii Ponoi Coalition's Hawaiian History Month. And we want to just wind it down and say mahalo to our beloved queen, Lydia Lili'uokalani, for her legacy that you've heard about tonight. We welcome all of you to come back to our next panel on Friday night. Aloha no kako.
Anybody there? Hello. Ekali ki paya le maile. Ah, vai kuka le la pau. 